All right, ladies and gentlemen. I said we weren't going to have a Thursday show, but we're going to have a Thursday show. And we're doing this a little bit differently today. Jason Hot here in the studio. I am the editor-in-chief here at Sci-Fi For Me. Welcome, everyone, to this edition. We are live from the bunker. And it is a pre-recorded program today because we're getting ready for the holidays and such. And so we're doing things a little bit different. But uh, this is a conversation that I've been wanting to have for a little bit because there is a website, there's an organization called Stack Up. It is a nonprofit, and I'm intrigued by the concept here because it is a, a setup where uh, we're dealing with uh, veterans that button off, and it is uh, geared toward helping them uh, with PTSD and transitioning from uh, army life, military life, to uh, civilian life. And joining me now is the founder of uh, Stack Up, Captain Stephen Mashuga. Welcome, sir. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me on. I'm I certainly good. appreciate it, Jason. So let me let me set this up just a little bit because we we follow a number of comic book creators here. And uh, there's the connection. And there's the connection. <laughs> and one of those uh, is the uh, the crew that does the the comic book rags, which features a lead character who is a redhead military type, and it's based off of a woman named Liz Finnegan who is part of your organization. And I saw uh, earlier that she was doing a fundraiser that uh, if they get to a certain uh, dollar amount, she's going to wear a certain outfit. And a lot of people are very excited about this. Uh, <laughs> but, but it got you on my radar, and I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, well, this is an intriguing notion here. What is this, what is this organization here? Because I'm, I'm, I'm having conversations over the last month with several people about mental health, especially with regard to, to veterans. And I see what you guys are doing here with video games. So t take me through the, the Reader's Digest version here of what Stack Up is, what y'all do, and then we'll get into how you got started with it. Okay, so Stack Up, we're a military charity. We support U.S. and allied veterans through video gaming and geek culture. Uh, that does include comic books. So as you can see, we've got a couple friends in the industry. Uh, so we got four main programs. We have our supply crates where we send uh, games and gear to units deployed forward to combat zones, folks recovering in military hospitals and uh, individuals who are struggling back home. Usually the Xbox is the first thing to go if you can't keep the lights on uh, or Billy needs braces. Um, so that's the first thing usually to go. So we help out there where we can. We have our air assault program, which kind of got curtailed with COVID, but it's our make a wish, uh, sending disabled or deserving veterans to various gaming events like E3, Comic-Con, studio tours, things like that. We have our stacks program, which is our volunteer efforts around the globe, uh, individuals wearing red shirts, getting out of their community and helping out where they can, whether or not, whether it's picking up a park for Earth Day or helping, uh, you know, helping out wherever they can in their community. And then lastly, but certainly not least, is our Overwatch program, which is our 24-7 suicide prevention team online through Discord for veterans, uh, focusing on just getting individuals talking uh, in a place where they feel comfortable. And that's usually on Discord or playing games in some capacity. And uh, that's that stack up uh, the Reader's Digest version, as you said. So how did all of this get started? You, you've served time in the military. You were in the Army, by the way. Thank you for your service, sir. And you come, you come home, and how do you go from being deployed to this? Well, I guess we got plenty of time, so I'll give you the full story. Uh, so when I was deployed overseas, my infantry company, and this, is, this was just the German, the seed that started the conversation, but the infantry company I was attached to got a package in the mail from a library back home. Uh, and it was a crate of third-hand Harlequin romance novels. Um, so, you know, as an infantry company, it's a bunch of dudes. 
Uh, we didn't really have a lot of use for something like that. So we ended up using them in the confiscated arms range for target practice, just for funsies. Because, you know, what else are we going to do with, you know, a thousand of these, you know, tawdry bodice rippers, you know, that sure. kind of thing. Sure. So, but it was right then and there, it kind of became obvious. It's like, hey, you know what? People back home are just finding whatever nonsense they can and boxing it up. And they're kind of like, hey, we're helping. Like we're help, we're helping the troops and we're going to send them this stuff. And everybody's yeah. like, ooh, that's nice. And then you look at what they're sending over and it's like, all right, this is, and we got a lot of that. We got a lot of people, I don't want to say virt- virtual signaling before virtual signaling was a thing, but it was very much like, hey, we're helping the troops. And that took me a very long time to understand that America likes looking like they help, but as far as actually putting the time and energy into helping, not so much. So when America says it loves its troops, it loves its troops insofar as it can put yellow ribbon stickers on their cars and wave flags and have parades and things like that. But when it comes to, hey, you know, Sarge, Sarge isn't sleeping well at night and he's having trouble and he can't find work and it's just they don't want to see that side of it. So, and you know, I, un- that was like, that was 2003. So that was mm-hmm. way back in the day. Right. I didn't think anything of it. Just kind of like, okay, that's something. And then um, when I got out of the service, uh, I've, I've always been into gaming. Gaming's been my, my rock all these years. Anytime I do anything, come home from work, get out of the gym, get done training in the military, video gaming, that picture is the yeah. perfect. That's, <laughs> That's what I try to tell everyone. Like, you want to know what my life yeah. is? It's like that is my life right there. Is, like, how can is, I sneak? Is that regulation? Are you are you actually I allowed reg- to do that? I mean, <laughs> regulation is a strong word. It's not like I'm gonna be like, is that a Game Boy in your pocket, son? No, it's not like anything like that. It's like you can have anything. You can have a can of dip. You can have anything you want in your pocket. Right. It's just one of those things. Now, when you start trading out, you know, grenade pouches for, you know, for you know, dip cans and things like that. It's like, that's when people, when it starts to affect mission readiness, Sure. you know, you've got a machine gun ammo <laughs> belt pouch and you just stuff it full of t- toys and treats. It's like, all right, you're crossing a line there. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's not break. There's no real regulation. And as a matter of fact, it's like, I wasn't the only guy that did that. Uh, a lot of folks overseas, you know, as back when I was in gaming was not where it was at now, where everybody has a cell phone, everybody's playing candy crush and, you know, against an impact on their phones, Fortnite, all this stuff that you can just play on your phones now. That wasn't a thing. Yeah. So myself and my little shop of nerds over in the Intel shop, we were all gamers. And we were, you know, I was the cool captain because I was the guy who was talking to all the E4s. I like telling, I like saying to people, like I was a, I was a specialist in a captain's body. Like I was with those <laughs> kids, quote unquote, you know, the guys who are a couple years younger than I am, but I outranked them and I was in charge but in essence, I'm like, oh, did you hear this game came out? Oh, that's awesome. You know, all right, sir. That's awesome. So I got out of the service and started working in D.C. as a government contractor. Worked at a bunch of three-letter agencies. And really cool mission, really cool job. Enjoyed it. But I just felt something was lacking. And gaming always came back to me. Like, it was always like, I'd love to do something in gaming. How can I get involved and do something? And I just wasn't really happy with work. And so uh, I started writing at a place called Sarcastic Gamer, which was just a blog at the time. But that blog grew up uh, and it was built by a, an individual named Jeremy Adams, who was the founder of a charity organization called Extra Life. And Extra Life is raising money through video gaming and 24-hour marathons for kids. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, that's really cool. I never thought about it. And nobody was doing anything like that at the time. It was pretty unique. So I was like, this is really neat. I like this. Um, but not. I don't have any kids. I was married for 15 years, but I, we never had kids. It was just kind of like, I'm not really feeling the kid thing. So about that time, I, uh, one of my buddies who deployed with me to Iraq uh, got out and had gotten back in in the time that it took me to, you know, a couple of years down the road. You know, a lot of guys get out of the service and they find themselves just kind of lost in the civilian sector. So they go back in. And I mean, every, I think everybody who wears a uniform feels that, that pull just a little bit every now and again, we're just like, man, I wish I was in the service still. Right. Cause there's something you, you just can't, you can't, there are definitely as much as it sucks. There are definitely some days where it's like, man, that was awesome. So well, uh, I, I would guy, imagine the camaraderie, especially because oh, you guys, you guys are of a, a certain 
mindset, experience set, things that other people don't understand because it's it's not a shared experience with anybody in civilian life. I mean, you you if you're not if you haven't spent time in uniform, you probably just don't understand what it's like. I mean, you can only explain it just so far. Right. And that's I, I, the the, uh, the analogy I like using that is extremely unpopular uh, among the uh, woke audience is it's like being in prison. Mm. It's like I can tell you what, you know, you can watch all the Orange is the New Black you, as you want, but unless you actually live that life, you can't explain it to somebody and it will be like, oh, that sounds crazy. It's like, yeah. no, 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 no. So when you talk to somebody who's been in and in the service, it's like, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a whole different thing, and you can you can get into huge conversations with guys and gals about what they did in the service, and oh, I've never heard that. What what was that? What did you do? And that was amazing. So so yeah, a lot you you miss out a lot of the camaraderie. So so my buddy got out, went back in, and was immediately shipped to Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, so he got over there, and he knew I was doing this writing for this blog and doing stuff with Extra Life, and interested in you know, it's like hey. You know, we're bored out of our minds over here. Is there anything you can do? Can you reach out to your contacts and see if you can get us like an Xbox or something? I was like, hey, all right, sure. See what I can do. So I reached out and the response we got back was overwhelming. It was ridiculous. Like we got pallets, people cleaned out their uh, prize cabinet, you know, their, their cabinets and closets and just like sent it all to us. And, uh, and by, by us, I mean me. It was just me at the time. And so... I, uh, I had way more stuff than I could use, but I boxed up as much as I could, sent it to my buddy. He sent back these awesome pictures of a, a they had hijacked a briefing projector and were um, using it. They were having DJ hero and guitar hero competitions against the side of a Connex. And it was just like one of these, oh, wow, that was really cool. Now, what happens there is you give one guy an Xbox and then the guys to the left and right of them are like, well, I want an Xbox. Right, <laughs> and so Joe's suddenly Joe starts going. Oh, this crazy captain who's just sending people Xboxes, I guess. So I started getting more and more emails, and I still had plenty of stuff from that initial drop. And I'm like, "Hey, there might be something here." And sure enough, that was the uh, that was the start of the stack up back in the day. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's how it all came to pass. It was just started off as just getting Xboxes and PlayStation to guys gals overseas, and it has uh, definitely morphed and grown over the years. So. Well, now, I guess the the question on all of that is uh, why video games? Because a lot of people are sitting there going, well, you know, video games, first person shooters, especially, you know, they wanna they wanna sit there and and connect it to gun violence and all of these different things, and sure. it it feels almost counterintuitive that you would have. Uh, people who are deployed overseas uh, basically blowing off steam by playing video games that are kind of similar to what you actually go out and do. I mean, um, there was there was one guy, my, my wife has a friend who, when he came home, he's he's been dealing a little bit with PTSD and he can he can play things like World of Warcraft, for example. But Call of Duty gets to a certain point and he has to stop. Yeah, and that's it. It makes me wonder. You know, they do a lot of studies about how video games can help with transitioning back to civilian life and all these different things. How is is there a particular mode of thought when it comes to the kind of programs that you guys have set up? Were there were there specific reasons why video games were the were the approach? Well, first off, they say do what you know, and gaming was all I ever knew. And gaming was the thing I did to blow off steam while I was over there. I mean, right. obviously, you know, you saw what I was up to. So that said, uh, you know, the biggest games in the world right now, Call of Duty, Fortnite, you know, games about avatars running around with assault rifles and blowing each other's heads off for fun. And that's just, that's what's popular. Apex, I'm trying to think of all the different games about shooting people. Yeah. Scavengers <laughs> are coming out. Like, that's just, but that's just the thing. It's like, I've got, that's, uh, and so, you know, a lot of marketing dollars go behind that and they're well, they're very well put together. They're very well made and it's what guys and gals want. You know, that's pound for pound. You put, you know, top three games. It used to be Call of Duty, Battlefield, Madden. And now, Battlefield's kind of fallen off, and now it's Call of Duty, Madden, and then 
we're not sure from there, you know, it kind of diversifies from there, but we don't just send over, Hey, here's call of duty. And that's what you're playing now. Cause we know that's what you guys like, right? Yeah. It's, we usually get, we get, um, wish lists from the individuals. So it's like, Oh, you know, I really want a switch with animal crossing. We can do that. So, but the, um, as far as gaming, there's, there's a couple different roads you can go down as far as like, well, why would they play games about shooting people? Uh, a lot of, all right, so as a civilian, it's important to recognize that first off, 22 million veterans in America. And of those 22 million veterans, like how many of them served in frontline combat units who were actually kicking doors and pulling triggers? You know, it, it's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. Now, those people are the ones who are actually doing the Call of Duty shit, as you might say. And those people might be the ones who are affected most by that kind of gameplay. But generally speaking, you have line cooks and mechanics and helicopter pilots and things like that that don't see that kind of stuff all all the day, every day. And it's not the same level of kind of uh, shock as, you know, it's still just a video game for them. Now, right. for those other folks who are actually your, your special forces, tip of the spear operator kind of mindset, God damn this fucking hair. I need somebody to, I need to go through hair and makeup before I come in today. Um, <laughs> But uh, for those folks, it almost acts as a bit of immersion therapy where it's like, oh, you're afraid of spiders? Well, we're going to put a spider near you for, you know, over and over and over again until you are, your, your reactions to that spider are kind of deadened, which right. it's another way to do it. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying like that's what we're doing. We're, going, we're not going out of our way to be like, now play this game, six, uh, you know, 30 minutes after a close encounter with an AK-47. Uh, we're not doing anything like that. It's just... That is another line of thought as far as like, hey, this is where we can get some good out of some of these video games. It's like, hey, you're you're dealing with your trauma that might happen in a way that you're not expecting. Like a perfect example was Modern Warfare 2 for me when I came home. There is a, in the very first scene of that game, you are in a Humvee patrol in, and you're going to liberate Kabul. I can't remember the, the whole storyline, but you're, you're rolling into Kabul and it's hostile. It's not like, you know, you're just doing a presence patrol. You're rolling in and you're going to hit, hit contact. And the thing that that tweaked me about that was, I think it was Second Ranger Bat, but just listening to the comms and the comm static and the, the uh, there was a little squelch break every time the comms would, somebody would key the mic and you hear that little, and then it's just like, it was so realistic that my brain was just going, Whew. yeah wow, this feels just too real. And then you get into the game and you're like, oh yeah, okay, we're fine here. But man, it was, it was that little that little thing that just like, you never know what's going to trigger little things like that, where it's like just even radio communications where it's like, wow, they really got this on point. So you never know what's going to do it. And uh, I know I've kind of danced around it as far as why game, why these games and why, but that's what we've come to understand over the years as far as why people like those, you know, people who are in those situations like those games. Now, That's the best I got. <laughs> when when you when you've got because uh, you've got the stuff that you send overseas to the to the folks that are deployed, uh, how how do you have to adjust what what approach do you take uh, for uh, domestic? Are you, you guys are are helping with with people that are here as well? How different is it? Because you've got the you've got the 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 phone number. You've got the phone line. You've got all of those things, but you know, de- giving out the video games and the and the consoles and stuff is it essentially kind of the same type of program here, or is there more one-on-one contact? Is there more you know, event type of things? Because I've seen some video of some, you know, some groups that have getting together. What what's the difference between overseas versus stateside? Overseas is kind of a fire and forget. You get some emails from guys. I mean, fortunately, if they're <clears throat> if you're getting emails from folks, generally they're in they're in a position where they can respond to you. But generally, you fire those out there, and it's like, well, hopefully they you hear back from them that they received it. Like you're hoping that all right, hey, we get a thank you, because as much as you want, like you want to get feedback from these units that you're sending stuff to, and generally mm-hmm. we do, but you know, every now and again, we'll send something out. We it just, you never hear back. And it was like, well, I hope somebody got it. Or I hope that guy didn't end up, you know, getting killed over there. You know, you don't, you don't know, you don't know what the situation is. So a lot of them are just kind of fire and forget. Right. <clears throat> Stateside obviously is a lot more 
in play. You can pick up the phone and call the guy and be like, hey, <laughs> you said you were going to take some pictures and, you know, did you get everything all right? Any issues? Anything you want to talk to us about? Um, obviously, a lot better internet here stateside versus yeah. overseas. You never know what kind of like, and when there was conversations about like the always online console, we were sweating a little bit where it's like, whoo, this is going to change our business model a bit. But generally speaking, we will load up all the hardware, software, you know, patches as best we can before we send the stuff out, you know, to try to alleviate some of the pain, you know, nothing. It's the Christmas day concept of, you know, hey, let's get little Billy an Xbox, you know, Xbox One X and they pull it out of the case and then it's like, okay, well, now you've got six hours of downloads to go through before you can play a game. And it's like, ooh, we're trying to, and yeah. then now, you, now you take that and you're in Afghanistan where it's like, well, I got to go to headquarters so I can download this patch on a thumb drive and then when I come back out to where I'm at, we can, you know, it's a mess. So it could be a lot more involved. But a lot of the times we're just kind of, you do what you can with the units forward and that's the best we got really. Yeah. So what kind of feedback have you gotten? I mean, when you do get responses back, when you get people that, that reply or they answer, you know, they, they send you thank you notes or, or, you know, give you feedback on what kind of games or consoles, what, what has the response been? Oh, it can be anything from the usual, like, Hey, thanks for this. This is awesome to, you know, some of the more, um, I don't want to say expressive, but I mean, we've definitely had some great responses of guys sending back pictures of them doing uh, competitions or something like that, where it's like, oh, hey, uh, you know, we had a Halo tournament. Whoever won the Halo tournament got a day off. So, I mean, things like that. So, I mean, random stuff like that is what we're attempting to, you know, that's kind of what we get uh, as far as uh, feedback, you know, and you never know what we get, but uh, every now and again, you know, it's either you get nothing or sometimes you get a thank you and some pictures. And that's, that's what we, what we strive for at least. Yeah. Now on the overwatch program, because this is not sending out video games. This is, this is a little bit, uh, I guess, more intensive. How, how exactly does this work? And when, when did y'all decide to add this and, and set this up as a program? Cause this, I see, I would guess this one here probably takes a lot out of people. Yeah. Yeah. We've got about, we've got three full-time employees and 17 volunteers right now on staff doing overwatch for us. And that is a, uh, it's a, it's a draining process. Uh, the, they came about um, as stack up continued to grow and we start, we kept continuing to build a community out. Uh, we'd have guys and gals who would jump into voice, you know, chat and voice chat and veterans have a pretty dark, dark sense of humor mm -hmm. a lot of the time. So, you know, you say some stuff and everybody just kind of laughs it off. But every now and again, somebody would say something and be like, Ooh, okay. They might be serious about, uh, the, you know, they call that suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation, where it's not just like they're not screwing around. And right. I knew the, the directors and I kind of sat around and said, Hey, if we don't do something, we, these, one of these guys is going to disappear and we won't know what, like, they'll just, they'll just kill themselves. So we put in a very informal, like uh, community based kind of just, Hey, keep an eye on everybody. And if somebody said something like, maybe it's something we could talk about. And it wasn't formal. It wasn't, nobody was trained. It was just us being cognizant of keeping an eye on our community. And, you know, we weren't planning on doing anything with it, but the risk, again, the response back we got was suddenly people were like opening up more. They thought they like, whether I had a bad day at work or my wife just left me and I have sitting in front of my gun kind of levels of, you know, interactions we've had with uh, individuals in the past. It's just like, okay, we're really doing some good with this program. So, right. uh, yeah. So um, I'm seeing here the, the Overwatch team and I, Chris Coons, I don't know why I, I look at this guy and I think, I think I know this guy, but I don't know where I would know him from. So you've got now all, all of these are volunteers. Uh, no, point? those three are actually paid employees. Paid they are okay. our shift. They are shift supervisors, and keep uh, keep the volunteers online and trained up. And yeah, there you go. There's a bunch of our volunteers. So, and, uh, how hard is it to find volunteers for this particular program? I mean, um, and, finding and, them is not hard. That's the easy part. Everybody wants to help, right? Everybody right. says, "Oh, I want to do this." 
screening uh, them though? Yeah, that's where <laughs> things get difficult. It's like yeah. actually getting them into to the process. We have a pretty uh, we have a pretty intensive training program through Psych Armor to get volunteers up to speed with on how to deal with an individual with suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation. Like, what are your what are the steps to handle a person like that? How do you report a person like that? If you think somebody's getting ready to hurt themselves or someone else, there's all kinds of different things you need to know. And going through all that training is a lot of work. Yeah. And so it's one thing to be like, ooh, this sounds interesting. I want to get involved. And then you, you know, you hand over a pile of textbooks and go, okay, good luck. And then usually people will do the first one and be like, ah, oh, well, you know, I'm really busy and I, you know, I got work and this, that, and like, okay, well, we'll be here. If you want to help, great. And, and, uh, not everybody it's you get people trained up as quickly as you as you can but it acts as kind of like a gate mm -hmm. to weed out the people who are just there to be like not serious about it because if you're serious then you'll do the work it's like anything have you uh found this as you go along with this and the longer you do this is it easier for you or does it I don't want to say it brings back memories or, or triggers experiences or whatever. Yeah, Does yeah. It, it's, I, I get what you're saying. It's staring into the abyss too long and something. Yeah, <laughs> because like, because you're doing – this is your full-time gig, right? Oh, uh, yes, this is my full-time gig. Sorry, okay. Just, no, it's all right. So what I was wondering is if, you know, the longer you do this – because I know a, a lot of times with just regular – with regular work, regular jobs that don't involve, you know, PTSD or military or anything, there's still the stress of work and you come home and you and – you, it's something that you can leave behind and leave at the office. But sometimes you bring it with you. And now here you are in this organization where you're dealing with this kind of thing where this could be 24 seven, you could get, you know, you could get somebody at two o'clock in the morning who's sitting there ready to be done. How do you cope? And how does the staff cope? I mean, do you have particular training for putting it aside for a little bit? Um, well, the uh, the influx of folks that we get in isn't too strong. Like we got, we we have been doubling our numbers every year since we opened the program. We started at fifty, and now we're up to two hundred ish, as far as per individuals coming in for services annually. And as far as like being able to turn it off, I mean, I'm I'm the guy in charge, so I mean, I don't see a lot of the ground level stuff. I am in charge of like making sure the lights are on and all the other programs are functioning uh, at the same time. The, uh, the three shifts supervisors and the volunteers, are the ones who are a little bit closer to the, uh, to the action, so to speak. And they're the ones who are dealing with the day-to-day -day individuals coming in talking about significant other problems and, you know, individuals at the end of their rope. And those are the guys and gals we have to like keep an eye on and make sure they're doing okay. Cause we've right. had some pretty traumatic, you know, it's, it's tough because you, you get some of it on you when you are in that world. Like you can't not, you know, unless you're completely a sociopath and just have no emotional ties to anything, which would be a pretty good thing to have. You know, a an empathetic counselor is great, but I'm sure the burnout rate is extremely high. And no, so sure. far people, we haven't had a lot of people turn over once they go through the training because they kind of know what they're signing up for. You know, yeah. it's like, and they want to do this. A lot of our folks are trying to get into counseling or going to school for counseling in some nature, or just want, this is how they feel that they can help. And, uh, you know, they, they realize it comes with the territory. So, you know, using a military axiom is like, we'll suck it up and drive on kind of thing. It's like, yeah. well, this is part of the job that you signed up for. Now uh, is, is the, cause I, I look at, you know, stories about, you know, Facebook moderators, for example, and having to go through all of the different things that they, that they censor out, you know, oh, the violent yeah, yeah, news yeah. and all I've, of I've that. I've heard about that, yeah. And I, I would think that something like this would be kind of, not necessarily the same kind of thing, but do you ever worry that some of this experience would be, I don't, uh, not necessarily traumatic, but how tough can it get? for your volunteers? I mean, have you, have you had any of them that just sat there and said, I can't do this anymore? We, uh, it isn't so much, again, it isn't so much the volunteers, the volunteers know what they're signing up for. It's the folks okay. that, and 
generally speaking, if you're coming into our chat, either we know about you already, we don't have too many people coming in as a first line, like I'm going to kill myself right now and here's my gun and things yeah. like that. So, I mean, we don't deal with a lot of the immediate, we need to get the police involved and have them bring, you know, take a, you know, do a weapons check and things like that, like health and wellness checks and things. Uh, we're not dealing with as many cases of that. So we haven't had a lot of volunteer burnout as far as that goes. Uh, we did have an issue where somebody underage and out of the country came in and had some real issues. And we, you know, it was a, just came into general chat and started, you know, more or less asking for help. And we did what we could to support them. But I mean, there's only so much you can do yeah. being outside of the country and underage. Like there's all kinds of legal issues and, you know, we can't really, they, they can't really do anything with them, but it definitely traumatized some of our staff because we were not expecting it. They were just playing like, you know, among us or among us or something. And, you know, then this person comes in and is waving a gun around and is like, oh, okay, mm. this is, I did not sign up for this. So, so you have volunteers <clears throat> who are also fundraising. Uh, yeah, you, you guys, you, you, well, let, let me go this. <clears throat> Elizabeth, uh, what does Elizabeth do for you? She is the, the stacks program and community manager. So what is, what does that involve with the, with the stacks program? Well, the stacks program are a volunteer element. Those are the folks that get out, uh, and do stuff in their communities as far as like people that want to get involved nationwide and just want to volunteer and do some good for stack up. And uh, what ends up happening there is we kind of give everybody just a lot of leeway. It's like, Hey, if you want to help out and do something and you want to wear a red shirt while you're doing it, great. Like we're not dictating. Uh, Liz is a little bit more on the ball as far as like, okay, earth day was a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Like she had, and we did something for Valentine's day too, you know, just random things that were happening as far as like, focusing our community efforts to get them to get out and do something, which has been extremely difficult during COVID. Yeah. So she's done a great job of trying to keep it all together. You know, how do you run a volunteer community where the objective is to get out and do good in your communities when you're not allowed to leave your house? Oh, sure. So it's been a, it's been a tough year and she's done a great job holding it together, holding it down. And now that things are opening back up, things are starting to move forward and we're getting more, more efforts and, Things like that. Now, this whole thing that she put on with the the rag stuff, this yeah. was a total. I called her at eleven o'clock on a Saturday night because I saw the tweet. Just kind of it was eleven o'clock <laughs> on a Saturday, and I go, Liz, is there anything you want to tell me here? Because like, because this I is saw, this yes, is the that outfit. was the. Yeah, that was the. Hey, Liz. Uh, you know, I'm literally just like kind of rubbing my temples, and I'm like, so uh, what are we doing here? What's going on? <laughs> and uh, she explained what, what was going on. Now, if you've read the comic at all, and you know, like they like putting her in less than no clothes anyway. So yeah. I mean, this is par for the course. So, but I just was like, hey, because it took off in a way nobody was expecting. It was just like, well, she yeah, was making... I mean, she's because the original goal was 5,000, I think, yeah. wasn't it? And, and, uh, and oh, it was, I don't even to... think it was that. I think it was a thousand. And yeah. then it kept just going up and up and over. 48 hours she was like knocking on ten thousand dollars and i was like okay for and for my next magical trick what are we doing next you know it's like holy cow yeah so definitely well, some and definitely I've a seen, bit of a surpriser i've seen a lot of that kind of activity in in and around the indie comics community especially where they have you know, not just the indie comics books that are raising a lot of money, but somebody will sit there and go, hey, we need to, you know, we want to do this fundraiser. Um, you know, we see in over on the YouTube side of things, there are a number of groups. Uh, they just raised uh, oh, something like 42000 I think, for Zack Snyder's uh, charity of choice, the, the suicide prevention. And, you know, the... There were a number. There are a number of those fundraisers that they do uh, to raise money for various different charities. I know Drunk Three PO has got one that he does. He's selling. He sells T-shirts, and he's he's giving a thousand dollars to a different charity every month. So it's this kind of this kind of uh, collective uh, charitable mentality that I think probably is what bubbled this up. And well, it certainly caught my attention because you know. Th you have this kind of thing going on all the time. And I'm, I'm a little bit more, 
hyper aware of when various different organizations are doing this kind of thing to raise money. And when this, when this popped up and she said, no, this is a for real thing. I was like, um, I wonder how the organization feels about this because that's, there's not a whole lot there on that outfit. And uh, she apparently has confirmed that she's, she's made the purchase, but when when groups like this, when somebody says, hey, I want to do something, and it's something that kind of makes you scratch your head a little bit, have you ever have you ever told anybody no? Have you ever said, eh, uh, yes. it's not a, not a good idea to do that? We had a uh, porn actress a few years ago that was looking to get involved, and she was like, I love what you guys do. This is what I want. And she was like looking to... She was trying to cash in and by cash in, she was looking to make a donation, but she was looking to do some sort of drive where uh, she would take a Marine to, or what was it? Something about, oh, going to a Marine ball or something like that. Ah. It's like a charity effort. And it was like, oh, that's cute. That's nice. But the way, like, it was one of those, like, this is going to be toxic if we do this. Like, <laughs> this might be a problem. And then it turned out to be a huge problem because then her and her significant other got brought up on, child porn oh. uh yeah it was bad uh, it, you know using actresses underage and things like that and it's like okay we dodged that bullet yeah. but that's a reason why you, when you get into bed like you try and try to avoid getting in bed with folks like that but at the same time it's just like hey we're not getting a, a lot of money out there and if somebody who is you know we we have another person who reached out and said hey i want to i want to fundraise for you and somebody reached out to me and said, that person is incredibly toxic. And it's like, well, but if they're going to raise $100,000 for the troops, yeah. I don't know what you want me to say. Like, we're not making that kind of scratch where turning that down makes a lot of sense. Like, I, I get it. He, that, that person might not be popular in the community, but, you know, or might just be, you know, you know Alex Jones of video gaming kind of mindset. But it's like, yeah, but he's trying to help us. So I don't know. Sorry. We have to be Switzerland over do, here. It's like we take all comers. Do you offer guidelines for people who sit there and say, hey, I want to raise money. I want to do a fundraiser. What can I do? Do you have any kind of a of a help sheet or anything to say? Yeah. This yeah, is the kind a, of things that you can do to help us out. Yeah, we have a, a whole team devoted to making sure that people are staying within the boundaries. Our influencer re, re, uh, relations team, it's kind of like white glove concierge service so if we get a name like this coming in and they want to do something it's like all right well go talk to you know go talk to our team and let's work out the details here's what we've done in the past here's what people have done for us that have been successful here's some strategies on how you can be successful and they can either go with it or just do what again at the end of the day we can't keep any from anybody from we just have to take what we get you know right. it's like oh, you know if people show up and they help out then thank you for thanks for helping out and that's that's where we're at you know so. Do you do you have programs that you want to do that you haven't been able to do? If you've got the the five year plan, but oh man, it'd really be great if we could do X Y Z. Not really. No, we've uh, the four pillar programs that we have right now. Um, it gets really easy to um, look around, and you know, people. Are, you know, it's very easy for folks to get critical about what we do as far as well, why aren't you helping veterans employment or why aren't you helping with veterans homelessness or what about this? What about that? And it's like, well, this is, we're a small indie charity, mom and pop charity. We're less than a million dollars a year. We can't take on 17 missions. You know, it's like there are charities devoted to this stuff that aren't doing that great of it. Like they're doing all right, but I mean, there's still rampant problems for veterans across the board. It's like, we have to stay in our lane. So these are the missions that we've decided to take on. And this is, nobody's doing what we're doing. Every time we tell somebody we're doing what we do and what our organization is like, no one has even attempted to do what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, I was so really that's, surprised. To, so I was like, they're, they're doing what with video games and, and, yeah. and this. So, well, let me ask you this because there's a lot of discussion online, a lot of, a lot of chatter back and forth when you talk about, you know, anytime there's, you know, uh, a, a hurricane or a tsunami or, you know, some kind of a natural disaster. Uh, there's always talk about, you know, donating to organizations like the Red Cross or the Salvation Army or whatnot. And invariably, it always comes up that out of however much money goes to an organization, X percent 
never goes out and helps anybody, you know, because you've got all sure. your administrative costs and, and that kind of thing. So just in a broad sense, if I if we have here a hundred dollar donation to stack up, how much of that actually goes into programs and how much of it is in an administrative stuff? Yeah, that's a big fist fight in the charity world as far as how much the dollar to mission ratio, as I yeah. like to call it. Um, we're at night, we were at 90% because of COVID, we're down to 86%. I'm not happy about that, but I mean, we told you one of our major major platform pieces is our aerosol program where we would fly veterans around the, the globe and we couldn't do any of that. So, and we couldn't do a lot of our stacks program stuff because nobody could leave their houses. So we tried to step it up with our other two programs, but there's only so much you can do. You can only send out so many Xboxes and you can only, you know, you can only add so many more staff members for in our Overwatch program. Uh, so we're not doing too badly. Um, there's also a conversation out there where it's like, Hey, we're trying to do like, again, it's, it's a big conversation in the charity space where it's like, Hey, as long as you're making an effort to put most of your money towards mission, then you should be okay. If you're, if you're like a 50%, you know, if you're spending, if you're doing the wounded warrior thing from 2015, where you're finding out they're doing all these lavish parties for their executives and things like that. Yeah. It's like, that's a different conversation, but the intent is for a charity our size, it is extremely, extremely difficult to get anything off the ground and try to maintain that. Like for us to pay out an employee, like have employees at about, you know, have $50,000 of em employee uh, pay in, on payroll, you need like a million dollars. And that's, that's 95% going to mission then to have 5%. And that's just payroll. So think, and how much, you know, all right, that's $50,000. How many employees do you think you could hire for $50,000 a year? And uh, the other conversation is like, all right, we're, we're in mental health. All right. There's a lot of doctors and PhDs and things like that, that we want to bring on. And we'd love to talk to, they're not going to talk to us for minimum wage, like get the hell out of here with that. Uh, they want to help, but you're not going to get their attention. So you literally have to have the conversations like, well, as a charity, you want to bring on best and brightest. And in order to do that, sometimes you have to put some money out and uh, you know, it's, it sucks, but that's, that's the cost of doing business. And that's unfortunately nonprofit world gets, just gets the short shrift on this. It, it becomes impossible to pay anybody anything and still keep that dollar emission ratio at publicly supported levels. Like we've, we've had, it's rare, but somebody every now and again will be like, well, if you're not 85 or higher, then we're not going to work with you. And it's like, do you even know what that means? Like, I want you to sit down and look at the, look at the numbers mm -hmm. and let me explain, how much do you make? Like, I try to sit down and talk to people like, how much do you make a year? And it's like, okay, how many people do you have in your office? Now think about the bottom line of your organization. This is a for-profit organization. That's whole, that's a whole different thing. We do this. People donate money to us. Like there's no service that we're like, well, we're providing a service, but it's free. And so that money has to come from somewhere and we're not generating it. We're generating it through the kindness of strangers. Like there's not a lot in the way of just like, oh yeah, we just have this flow of revenue in every year that just, mm -hmm. that we can rely on. We're selling widgets and things like that where it's like, oh, right, if we sell just more widgets or we have a sale, we can make, we'll bring in this much money and it just doesn't happen that way. So no so, bake sales. So what? No bake sales. I mean, we're <laughs> kind of, we, we have, we have diversified the, the quote unquote bake sales in the form of Twitch streams. Yeah. So now we have hundreds and hundreds of bake sales happening simultaneously and some are more successful than others, but we have, I mean, we're in May, which is military appreciation month right now. And we have several hundred streamers signed up to stream, raise money for us through the month of May. And um, it's been a very successful season. We are, we just were, just scratching our new high score for May, which was two hundred seventeen thousand dollars last year, and we just crashed two hundred eighteen right now, oh, like today. Today, so we've got we've got what is it twenty fifth? So we got one more week. We got um, Memorial Day next Monday, and we expect a pretty big push there. So we're we're doing well. Yeah. But again, two hundred grand does not go as crazy as it is to say. Two hundred grand does not go far in an organization. How so, much? How much is your support coming from individual donations, and how much of it are you able to get through grants? Uh, grants are almost 
we get grants at the ten and twenty thousand dollar level. They're they're not to the point where you know you, you just hear about like oh we run our organization on grants. It's like, whenever I hear somebody say that, I just marvel at them. And then they look at us and they're like, you did what now? You have five hundred people raising money for you this weekend? It's like yeah, well that's a Twitch thing and. You know, that's why you're seeing more and more people, more and more charities and organizations that have nothing to do with gaming. Yeah. And they suddenly have found, you know, they hear stories of Dr. Lupo on Twitch raising $2 million for St. Jude's in a weekend or in four hours. I'm sorry, that was a four hour stream. But they hear that and they're just like, well, how do we get on that train? It's like, yeah, no kidding. We all want to be on that train, but right. it doesn't work that way. So you get all these charities that are now bum rushing the Twitch scene, trying to be a part of it. And it's like, yeah, but you're not really supposed to be here. Like, all, all they need, all they need is a hot tub, Steven. They got it made. Yeah, right? there you go. Yep. Hey, you laugh. That's um, I, uh, yeah. It's that's a that's a thing. Well, and I mean, hey, it's hey, girls get paid. I mean, they got to deal with a bunch of jackasses on Twitch anyway. It's like you know what? Just if you can if you can handle that heat, yeah. go for it. I mean, whatever. It's the only fans on <laughs> on Twitch. It's. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Well, and then you, how much, what about support from uh, the military? D is there any kind None. of a cooperative cooperative well, arrangement there at all? Uh, we've worked with various military organizations. Like they, they're more takers than givers. No, they mm -hmm. can't. Uh, we, we were trying to work with the army esports, army and air force esports team, but they have a policy in place where they cannot show favoritism to a charity because the money that they are given is by the government. It's gotcha. this weird yeah. yada, 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 where they can't do anything. Surprise. <laughs> so uh, yeah, not a lot going on there. Uh, they're happy to take, like we do events on posts and things like that. Like we will, despite not getting the support that we need from the military, we will continue to support military efforts. Like we do, uh, we will show up on bases and do live events and help out where we can. So you know, are there, are there now, and this is, this is a question that I'm asking mainly out of ignorance because you have mm -hmm. like with the police department, with law enforcement, you have the fraternal order of police, you have various different organizations. Does outside of the military and serving in uniform, are there groups of veterans, you know, you've got the Veterans Association, you, you, you got the VA, you've got the VFW and, and those groups. But do you have any civilian organizations that are just let's get together and confab and have a barbecue and play some ping pong or anything like that? Are there are there those yeah. groups? I mean, well, that's the funny thing is with VFW and American Legion and things like that, they watch their, you know, their Vietnam and Korea era veterans are disappearing or dying off and all that's left are your post 9-11 veterans yeah. and your post 9-11 veterans are not the kind of folks that are going to get up and go sit in a bar and smoke all day generally <laughs> they're the ones that want to play Fortnite together with a bunch of guys and they're seeing that they're losing out on the younger generation uh when i was having early on conversations you know i talked to a ceo or a cfo c-level staff for an organization and they would be like well i don't get this video gaming thing but let me tell you about my 20 year old it's all he right. does well, now, 10 years down the road, you know, gaming has outstripped both, you know, sports and the music industry and Hollywood combined to the tune of $180 billion a year globally. And so it's impossible to ignore, especially between that and things like, you know, AOC playing Among Us on Twitch. And I mean, it's gaming is just becoming this thing that it's a language, shared language with the younger audience out there. And well, those kids, you've got, you know, with the lockdown, you've had so many other people picking up and then, oh, yeah. you know, Batman showing up in Fortnite type of things. And you've got Animal Farm and all of these different things picking up. I would imagine that there are a lot more people that are into gameplay now than there ever has been. We had uh, our contact over at the Center for Disease Control because uh, they see they see veteran suicide as an epidemic. Mm -hmm. And that's how they're handling it. It's they're they're the chief for their uh, non-infectious diseases branch was this woman who's just like, look, I know you guys are trying to help, but I don't understand what you guys do at all. I don't, I get it. Don't particularly like what you guys do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, fast forward to six months into COVID, her husband is a big gamer. And I think there might be more than the story there, but the two of them were locked in the house together all the time and they started playing games together. 
And sure enough, within, you know, a couple months go by and suddenly we're talking to her and she's like, I get it now. Yeah. Like, I totally understand what you guys do. And I'm like, thank you. So <laughs> like, why, yes. why, when you get the negative reaction like that, I don't like what you guys are doing. Why would people have that opinion of your operation, your organization? What, what's the, what's the it's, thinking behind that? It's gaming. It's gaming in general. You know, we're coming from a long era of kid, you know, fat dorks in their basement, in their mom's basement, you know, playing video games yeah. and not interacting with people. Dungeons and Dragons nerds. Like, that's where I came from. That was my life growing up. Never popular. Not, you know, and that has pertained even to this day. Like, there are still people that are just like, oh, video games. Who does that? I mean, you're an adult. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> um, now, it's it's the rock and roll in the in the 60s conversation. It's like, oh, who can listen to that music? And now it's just because those old farts have gone and, you know, moved out, retired, they're no longer in charge. And those kids who grew up on iPads with Minecraft on it are now the guys who are making decisions. They're putting on uniforms. They're going to be our next senators and congressmen. Again, going back to the AOC Among Us thing, it's like, yeah, yeah we're going to get, we're going to have a president who's played all the way through Grand Theft Auto 9. It's just a matter of time. And those are the conversations we're having now that it's been 10 years of this where it's like, gaming is dumb, gaming stupid to... Well, I don't get it, but my kid, boy, he sure loves gaming to, all right, those kids are now in positions of authority and they want to work with us because they know what gaming is. And all these old school organizations are just like, we can't get these kids to pay attention to us anymore. Oh, gaming. Oh, so this yeah. thing you've been telling us for the last 10 years. Yeah. So it's yeah. almost like the military should, should do some recruiting using video games as their model. I mean, I mean, yeah. We we talked before Funny we started that. We, before we started recording. We talked about the thing you know dealing with you know the the Russian recruitment versus uh, what the army's doing now. But yeah. yeah, I'm like, why why is this your thing? You know, I it's like Limbaugh says the the military serves to kill people and break things, and that's that's what they do. And and it you don't have to feel good about. I mean, sure, you have to enjoy what you do to a certain extent because you have to be good at it and you have to, you know, you have to at least be be there. You have to be present for it. But, you know, I saw a photograph the other, uh, just just not too long ago, the, the largest group of graduates at West Point, you know, uh, I think 42 female African-American graduates at West Point. Okay, great. Good for them. Did they pass the standards or have the standards been lower? And see, and that, that brings on a whole other conversation about I was gonna say, where we are with the dangerous territory there. But uh, well, no, it's not so much though. Yeah, of course they're going to graduate West Point. That's fine. I, they, I mean, I had women serving the left to right of me as well. I mean, when I got out of the infantry, when I, when I went military intelligence, it was, it was both women and men yeah but infantry that's a whole different conversation special forces and ranger like you're hearing you know women that are going through the q course and things like that for special forces and it's like hey if they can if they can hit the standards fine and yeah of course there's the conversation about you hear stories about how the first two females who graduated ranger school which wasn't that long ago like a couple of years now i think yeah. but you were hearing grumblings of like yeah we kind of like we kind of changed some of the standards and we kind of push them through and things like that. And it's like, as an old infantry guy, it chaps my ass, but that's just the way this country is going. So, you know, it's like, yeah. all right, I guess we'll, we'll be fine. You know, if, I mean, I don't think it's, so I, the, I don't know. Again, we're yeah. getting into territory where it's like, Ooh, right. I, well, let me, I am let not me, trained it. let me steer it back then because, uh, you know, we hear a lot of statistics. Do you encounter, on balance, uh, more men veterans than women veterans who are responding to what you do? Yeah. I mean, just in general, the guy, we have guys, because guys generally, I don't know if they feel more willing to just go, hey, give me an Xbox. Uh, not a lot of thought behind it. Just like, yeah, I want to play games. Yeah. Give me an Xbox. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, it seems like most of our uh, requests come from guys. I don't know what that means, but I guess, you know, we definitely have females making requests. I mean, it's not out of the, out of the ordinary, but uh, yeah, generally speaking, I don't have the, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I'd love to see that actually what, what the male to female ratio is, but, but yeah, I mean, 
uh, it's not uncommon. And when is the stack up comic book hitting Indiegogo? <laughs> yeah, again, that comes back to the do what you know kind of thing. Right. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll reach out to Terminal Lance and see if we can do a crossover there with the, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, yeah, you have to, I, this comic book guy, are you familiar with Terminal Lance? And uh, I, I've, I've heard the name, yeah. Kind of the battle, Battleborn, or I can't remember what he, he just put out a comic book not too long ago, and it's pretty solid stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, if uh, anybody wants to find out more, uh, I guess the, the website is the best place to go, stackup.org. And where else can people find you? Um, the other place, if you want to immediately jump into our community, it's discord.gg backslash stackup.org. Just okay. all spelled out. And is there, I would imagine there's a link to that on, on your website. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Captain Machuga, thank you very much for being here, sir. We do appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, Jason. All right. And uh, for those of you who are here with us as we go through this, uh, hopefully you have a good Memorial Day weekend. We, of course, want to uh, recognize and thank all of those who have served in the military and their families for uh, the various different sacrifices that they make. We do appreciate that here. And we do hope that you have a good Memorial Day weekend. Uh, don't forget, we're off all of our programming back Wednesday. So between now and Wednesday, no shows, which means you can go watch our reruns that you've missed. And uh, we will be back Wednesday with new episodes, installments uh, for you. So in the meantime, we do invite you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, have your notifications turned on. Find us on all the, on the uh, socials. You can send us your feedback live from the bunker at sci-fi for me.com. And we will be back with more next week. Remember, there are four lights. Thanks for watching Sci-Fi for Me TV. Copyright 2021 by Flaming Dog Media, LLC. All rights reserved. No portion of this program may be retransmitted without the express written consent of Flaming Dog Media. You're watching Sci-Fi for Me TV, delivering the multiverse since 2009.